Hi, I'm Rebecca Brady and I'm the Senior Conference Producer at the MedTech Summit. Due to the new ISO 10993-23 update released in January, I'm here today joined by Don Powell, Principal Product Development Strategist at NAMSA to discuss the changes. Don has over 25 years of experience in the preclinical evaluation of medical devices, biological safety. He has specific expertise in the evaluation process outlined in Dash 1, as well as the expectations of the US FDA and other global regulatory bodies in their interpretation of biological safety evaluation of medical devices. Thank you so much for joining me today, Don. Glad to be here. So there seems to be a lot of industry chatter at the moment about this new standard. What is all the fuss about with the new 10993-20, sorry, the ISO 10993-23? And what are the other major changes that it's brought? Yeah, I think um, the main reason I think for all the chatter about the standard is, is well, two things uh, is first, it split from part 10. So irritation was taken out of ISO 10993 part 10. Um, and that gave us ISO 10993-23. Um, and then obviously probably the thing that everybody's chattering the most about is, is the introduction of in vitro assays for the evaluation of the irritation endpoint, um, which used to be in the standard, but now they have two methods that have been validated uh, and presented within, within the standard for us to use. You mentioned the in vitro method there. So can you tell us a little bit more about that and how that test compares to the in vivo? Yeah, yeah. So the in vitro, I, I think one thing to first note is that it's not an in vitro method for every type of exposure. Mm -hmm. um, it is specifically for skin um, contacting type devices or devices where in the past intracutaneous irritation was used appropriately or primary skin irritation was used appropriately. Um, so in that regard, the in vitro assay will, obviously it's in vitro, it's not an in vivo method. Mm -hmm. um, and it will give you a result that indicates whether your device is an irritant or a non-irritant. Um, and, it, and it does that through the use of extractions in saline and vegetable oil, which is similar to what we saw on the in vivo side, especially for the intracutaneous irritation study. Um, but but in, in essence, it's it's an in vitro assay. So it, it helps in terms of animal welfare concerns, um, but it's, it's just specifically as a replacement for two tests right now, the, in, the primary skin irritation study or the in vitro irritation, I'm, I'm sorry, the uh, intracutaneous irritation study. And um, you touched on this, but are there any other specific regulatory situations that we currently know of where in vitro method might not be the best choice? Yeah, there, and, and the standard speaks to some of these in, in general. Um, the standard will tell you that it's not for um, aerosols and gases, uh, just mm -hmm. the method wouldn't work well um, if your device contains something that would elute a color or um, somehow uh, contain a chemical that interferes with the uh, reduction of MTT, then those types of products wouldn't be appropriate for the in vitro assay. Um, also, it's, it's not a direct contact method. And by that, I mean, you can't take a small piece of plastic and directly apply it to the in vitro assay. It has to be through this extraction process in, ve in vegetable oil or saline. Um, and I, as I previously mentioned, it, it's specifically as a replacement right now, it's validated for the primary skin irritation test and the intracutaneous irritation test. So if you have a device that contacts mucosal surfaces or eye epithelial surfaces, then technically this study was not validated for those types of, of exposure. So, um, you know, you have to be careful how you use it. And, and keep in mind in part 23, the new standard, there still remains all of the special irritation tests, the in vivo studies for things like ocular irritation and mucosal irritation type contact. So those are still in the standard. Um, it's not just an in vitro assay standard. There's, mm -hmm. there's still a lot of the in vivo methods um, within the standard. And actually, uh, they haven't changed a whole lot uh, at all. 
Okay, and something the industry always wonders about is how notified bodies and regulatory agencies are going to sort of adopt these standards. So do we currently know how notified bodies and regulatory agencies like the FDA or the Japanese PMDA will adopt the standard? Yeah, we know some, we have some evidence of that out there right now um, mm -hmm. in Japan. Um, that one currently probably the most, uh, most information there because it's already the in vitro assay is already adapted into the MHLW uh, guidance. So there, um, you know, we can say fairly confidently that the, the in vitro method would be accepted. If we go to the FDA, um, certainly the FDA has um, been involved in the development of part 23. So that would give us some good feeling that, that they hopefully will accept the method but it hasn't, hasn't formally been recognized as a consensus standard yet. Mm -hmm. And so we don't know the official um, take, if you will, from the FDA perspective. Typically they update their consensus standards twice a year. So we'll probably have some time to wait to hear back from FDA on that. And I know that there's been an, an internal review of, of the standard, um, but again, we, we just, we don't have that feedback as of yet. And then, in the EU, for example, um, because the standard is the state of the art standard when it comes to irritation, albeit slightly confusing right now because we technically have two standards for irritation, part 10 and part 23. But this one I would say would trump the prior version because it is state of the art. So I think you could use that with confidence in, in, in Europe. But likewise, you know, if you already have in vivo data for irritation, as it stands right now, I don't think because of the issuance of the standard, you would have to go out and repeat in vitro irritation. Uh, I think there should be, you know, say roughly like an, a year grace period typically for you to make that conversion. So if you've already had testing completed and it's in vivo, I think I would stick with that. If you're still planning your testing, I think it would okay, be okay for an EU submission to incorporate the in vitro assay into your plans. Um, in other regions, uh, you know, especially like China, um, mm -hmm. you know, again, part 23 hasn't been officially adapt, uh, adapted into the Chinese regulation. But once that happens, and again, once the standard actually comes out as a uh, Chinese standard, I would hopefully expect China to accept the method as well. But that one, again, um, still a work in progress, I would say. It's great to have that global view. Thank you. Um, so what things might a manufacturer need to make sure they know before requesting this test from the laboratory? Yeah, I think just, just knowing the basic method and, and what it covers and what it doesn't cover. Um, and certainly, um, you know, understanding the composition of your device, just the exposure of your device to the patient, uh, because that exposure is going to tell you whether or not this method is applicable to your device or can be used for your device as it's validated currently. Um, and then, you know, the composition, I say that because the standard does, before it gets into testing, it does, you know, ask the manufacturer to look at the material characterization profile of the device, do literature search on those materials for any potential hazards that would indicate a hazard potential. And, and use that information to then plan your irritation evaluation as well. And, and you might not see as much feedback there from like say the FDA, but I would expect the, uh, a notified body in the EU would want to see that information because this standard tells you to do it as well as part one in terms of just understanding what's in your device. And then you have to consider as well the regulatory status, the regulatory situation. Um, you know, where you're submitting to and, and as best you know it, what's the regulatory status of the acceptance of an in vitro method for your device? Um, because you never want to, you know, use a test that uh, isn't going to be accepted if you know in advance that it won't be. But right now, as we mentioned, that's kind of up in the air, if you will, unknown um, for some of these areas. So you're going to have to make some of your best judgment there. But beyond that, I mean, just be ready for you know, a two vehicle extraction type type study, which is really similar to the intracutaneous irritation test in, in, in the past, and as well as in the present. And, you know, be ready for a situation where the conclusion 
will be based on the outcome of both those vehicles. So if saline essentially passes and vegetable oil fails, your device is classified as an irritant based on the, 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 the wording and the standard. So it's a, a two vehicle approach to a final conclusion. Great. This is a really interesting topic and one that people have loads of questions on. Um, I believe you guys have a NAMPS have a podcast special episode specializing in this. And um, where can people listen to that episode if they want more information about the part 23? Yeah, it, simply um, go to NAMPSA's uh, website, um, NAMPSA.com under the resources tab. And uh, we have a, an area specifically for podcast and, and you can connect the dots and find that that link there as well. And uh, the podcast is uh, available on, uh, you know, uh, where, where you find your normal podcast episodes as well. So um, it should be there to be downloaded. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been really great speaking with you. And um, thank you, everyone, for tuning in and listening. All right. Thank you.